Welcome to Breakthrough Spotlight. My name is Priya Khan, and I'm the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at Breakthrough, a nonprofit organization that uses arts, media, and tech to advance human rights and spark cultural change. In our new Breakthrough Spotlight series, we're speaking with artists and activists about creativity, justice, and healing amid the crisis of COVID-19. We encourage you to chime in on social media using the hashtag Breakthrough Spotlight and in our audience Q&A. Today, I'm joined by Christina Mevs Apgar and Ishita Srivastava, two brilliant culture change strategists who are committed to transforming how we value caregivers and build a system of community care. They advocate for the people who care for us, domestic workers and family caretakers across generations. Let's take a look at their work. Those are really powerful images and even more powerful stories. Um, you know, Ishita, you've shared with me that this crisis has shifted your work, not only because it's unprecedented, but also because for the first time in decades, care is really seen as a collective social responsibility. And I'm wondering how this reckoning has shaped your response and what messages you're trying to send while you have everybody's attention. Um, thanks, Priya. Yeah, so for us the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we there's a couple of things that we have seen happen very quickly. One is that it's things that we already know have kind of bubbled into the mainstream. One is that our health and well-being is actually very intricately connected. Um, so we are currently responsible for not only our own health and well-being, but we're caring for our loved ones, our families, and even for strangers and neighbors we don't even know. Um, and so we're deeply connected, and um, the idea that we need communities of care um, is, is kind of in the mainstream for the first time. And more than that, the idea that care should not, the onus of caring for ourselves and our families and loved ones should not just rest on us as individuals, or even on our communities who are actually doing a pretty wonderful job right now. But there should, but what we really need is sort of an investment in systems and structures and infrastructure that um, supports all of us to kind of care for each other and work and live with sort of dignity. Um, and so what that's done in terms of our messages, I mean, um, one of our kind of core culture change goals is to get people to think about care as a collective social issue and responsibility, um, which is something we always do. But for the first time we've seen, um, whether it's like through social media conversations or content or ads on TV, that that narrative is suddenly like the, a default narrative in the mainstream. And so we are really using that 
to um, amplify the narrative itself and also to bring new people into this idea of we are all caregivers right now. So we're reaching past our, our kind of usual audiences. We at Caring Across um, speak to family caregivers who are caring for an older loved one or a person with a disability. Usually in, in this moment, there's a lot of parents who have never thought of themselves as caregivers who are balancing caring for their child, caring for themselves, working from home, staying safe, um, and maybe even caring for like an aging loved one, like virtually. Um, and so we're you know, using this to get our message out to people and also just reach a much wider audience to think about care and caregiving as critical and as a collective. Absolutely. It's um, something that we're just really awakening to so many of us. And it's tremendous, the work that you are both doing and the work that your organizations have been doing for so long. I wanted to highlight a new initiative that the National Domestic Workers Alliance um, has launched. It's an emergency fund for domestic workers in response to COVID-19. And Christina, I'm interested to learn what are you hearing from domestic workers about what they need? Yeah, so when we say domestic workers, I just want to remind everyone that who we mean is house cleaners, nannies, and home care workers. Um, we knew that immediately most of our workforce would be out of work. Um, these are jobs that can't be done from your own home because you are quite literally working in other people's homes. So immediately we saw our workforce lose all income. Um, and because our workforce is particularly vulnerable because the work, um, there are no benefits, um, even such things as paid uh, sick leave or family leave um, or sick days, um, a lot of the work is in the informal economy. Um, so we knew that the loss of income was going to make our workforce particularly vulnerable. Um, also, the cash assistance that was pushed through federally, most of our workforce does not qualify. Um, so we knew that, that there was no help coming from them. And while we were going to advocate on their behalf um, via policy, we knew we wanted to get into the hands of as many workers as possible um, some relief. So that's why we launched the CARE Fund. Um, the workers that are still going to work are very vulnerable because they do not have access to PPE. So that's something we're also fighting for, in particular our home care workers, who if they stop showing up to work, our elderly neighbors would not have anyone to care for them, our loved ones with disabilities, and our workforce takes their responsibility quite seriously and are very close with their clients. So they're not going to just not show up but um, no one has provided them the PPE, the masks, the protective equipment, the gloves that they need to stay healthy and safe. Um, so that those are some of the stories that we're hearing from our workforce and a lot of food insecurity right now um, and um, housing insecurity. And so the, the funding that you're able to provide to each person, I understand it's about $400 per person and you're looking to raise, is it four or five million? through the campaign? Well, our goal straight out the gate was $4 million. I'm happy to report that we've raised over $20 million. Um, and yeah, our uh, I think it was over 90,000 individuals were donating online that the medium donation was $20. So um, the public really rallied around our care workers because um, like Ashita was saying in this crisis, we are truly understanding the value of care and that care is a community issue. It is an issue in our families. And so more than ever domestic workers, um, people are really uh, wanting to show their support for the work that they do. Absolutely, absolutely. That's really um, fantastic to hear. And um, we're, we're hoping that you have continued momentum in that effort. It sounds like it's really making a difference. Um, you mentioned that you're lobbying for policy change, for resource access, but something that really sets you both apart in your work is that you're also looking at cultural change and using media in innovative ways 
to tackle the cultural pieces of this, the cultural norms. And I'm interested to hear from both of you what that looks like. What is that work? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of norms that we work to change that we are we are still working on and this moment has really given us the opportunity to do that. One is that care work, whether it's paid domestic workers doing the work or it's unpaid family caregivers doing the work, this work has been devalued in our culture for centuries. It's been devalued because of, you know, pretty obvious things like sexism and racism. Uh, women have been doing this work behind closed doors. Um, and women of color have been doing this work, immigrant women have been doing this work, undocumented women have been doing this work. And so one is that it's just not valued and it's kind of invisible, even though it makes all other work possible, even though it fuels our economy and you know allows us to do everything we do. Um, and so one is really using this moment to make care and caregiving visible and it's happening, you know, everybody's at home and everybody's doing it or seeing it happen. And so it's actually quite the moment to make visible what we are all experiencing around caregiving. And the other, as I mentioned before, is, you know, thinking about this in, in the U.S. specifically, the kind of narrative of individualism means that we feel like we are solely responsible for things like caring for our families, for things like caring for our seniors or people with disabilities or our children. Um, whereas in many places, it's thought of as a collective social responsibility. That is, um, that is the cultural norm in, in places in other, in other countries. And when that becomes a cultural norm, then, then there's like a demand for infrastructure that supports that. And so that's the second norm that we are trying to push for using creative content, trying to get people to think of this as a collective responsibility. And I'd say the last thing is that um, both family caregivers and domestic workers are, you know, are struggling even more than usual in this moment. And that means they're looking for community. They're looking for a place to share what they're going through. And so the other thing that the creative content allows us to do is create uh, um, more people store for them to come together, for them to experience joy and levity. And so that's also why we create content. Um, Christina, do you want to add to that? Um, what I'll add is that um, we know that there is such a thing as um, winning the facts and then not winning the emotional truth of something. Um, and so we believe that it is not enough to just organize via policy or via grassroots organizing or electoral organizing. Um, there are lots of ways we believe power is built and we believe that narrative power, um, you need to fully feel something to then um, implement it into your life and change your behavior. So um, we take that and then we meet people where they are and um, whether that means they're on Reddit or they're on TikTok or they are watching reality TV. Um, and um, we also communicate with them the way they want to be communicated to. So we believe in stories. We believe that people inherently communicate in stories. And, um, and so we lean into that. Um, and I think both of those pieces are what kind of um, guide us even when we're creating content and um, shaping stories. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems like there's um, so much ingenuity in the approach that that you take and that issue that takes, you know, in the work. I know you work with comedy writers and you develop memes and gifs and you have all kinds of really um, entertaining but also meaningful content. And that's something that just draws audiences in. So I hope that there is um, a lot of appetite for that moving forward. It sounds like there has been and that it will just grow as the cultural awareness of these issues also grows. Um, and speaking of comedy, we actually wanted to uh, share a clip of a video that you have produced jointly. Uh, I understand that it hasn't yet gone live, but we are excited to share uh, an exclusive look. 
As coronavirus ravages the nation, businesses across the country are shuttered indefinitely. Americans are slowing down and staying at home for the first time in decades. What? I feel like I'm working more. Where did you get this knife? David, I'm gonna have to circle back. With bank CEOs fleeing to private yachts, America has come to a standstill. Standstill? I haven't stood still in over a month. Sweetie, I can't right now because I'm in the middle of a deadline. Carol, I don't have the report. Titans of industry watch as business is closed in America. Ramin, you cannot juggle with wrenches. No, Harold, I'm right here. I'm right here. Despite the shutdown, investors were cheered on Monday as stock prices stabilized. Oh, they were cheered? That's so great for them. Is this a s I'm, I'm sorry, folks. We're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to go to break. Cut. Honey? I just needed to be a little more quiet on set. No, I know. It's just that this like kindergarten daycare center co-working space new studio living room can get a little loud. By the way, I washed your pants. You're still streaming. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Nagin. We'll be back in just a moment with the weather. It's gonna be shitty. That made me laugh out loud a couple of times the first time I saw it. Um, it was just so inventive and so true. Um, I really loved it. And I'm, you know, interested, what, what was the process of creating that? Um, so we've been, um, for a couple of years now, working with um, the Center for Media and Social Impact at American University. They've invested in um, in using in sort of connecting comedy writers and professionals in the comedy um, space to social justice organizations like ours, and so we've been working with them before. And so as, when we wanted to develop some comedic content for this moment, um, we convened um, like a two-day virtual kind of think tank writers room of comedy writers. So five writers came in. Christina and I went in and kind of gave them our brief uh, issue area what's happening who's being what we're looking for and and they came up with ideas for like everything that could be produced in this current context so memes gifs um and short videos that could be recorded relatively easily without a camera crew um and yeah and so they produced i mean the the amount of the number of ideas that came out of that was pretty staggering. And so we've been kind of putting them into production and are slowly beginning to release them. And I think the interesting thing for us about this is that, as I sort of mentioned earlier, we're really trying to reach new audiences and um, and we're trying to reach them where they are, as Christina said. So we are really trying to sort of move past our brand platforms into spaces like like Reddit or like parenting and mommy groups and mommy influencers and sort of people who uh, we haven't necessarily spoken to before, but whose lived experiences these reflect um, mm -hmm. to kind of bring them into our circle in this moment. What was the experience like for you, Christina? Of, of watching the, the piece? Of creating and watching, of anticipating how it will go out into the world. <laughs> well, I was gonna say that I also have a PTSD when I watch the piece because I have a, a 10 month old upstairs who jumps into the frame and cries in the background. So um, I am also the audience for a lot of this content that is coming out. Um, so for me, watching the writers um, really marinate on what our issues and what they took from it was also interesting because you know, you're so in 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 the lane of your issue that sometimes you don't see things a certain way. Um, and so I loved hearing their perspective. And um, I also loved kind of the take on how hard it is right now in our homes, all of our homes. Um, domestic workers also are have families and they have their own chaos that is going on in their homes. So 
um, in addition to the loss of income, they are still caring for their own loved ones. Um, and we are all trying to figure out how to do that. And um, so I think that the process has been um, really, really, really creative. Um, and, um, and I think a lot of folks can relate to it right now. Yes, yes, for sure. We have another clip, um, something that illustrates the importance of acknowledging that some work can only be carried out person to person um, in a very human way. And so I wondered if we could share that. Leila, I miss you. We gotta change your diaper. So pull out one wipe, just one. No, just one. You're only gonna need the one. Nope, only one wipe. Okay. They feel like you're not listening. Look, what? Nope. Mm. Just one wipe. Oh. Oh, that's great. I I would be so impressed to meet a baby who could do that. I think <laughs> kind of, you know, super human. Um, yeah, robot creature. So it's it's definitely true that we need to acknowledge that work and acknowledge that. There's, there's certain ways that that work needs to happen and that our communities are built on that work happening in those ways. So to really value it. Um, you launched a new challenge actually on social media yesterday. It's called the Rosy Challenge and it's part of your hashtag care for all campaign. Could you tell us more about it? I think we may have lost Christina for a second. Um, I can jump in and share. So um, part of our work right now is um, really center caregiving in, as part of this bigger conversation of essential workers needing protections and benefits. And, um, and so we decided to use the Rosie the Riveter image from World War II. Um, and Rosie the Riveter was an image of how women were really keeping everything going during that time. And we're translating that to domestic workers and caregivers who are keeping things going right now inside our homes and asking people to basically take a picture, a selfie of themselves in the Rosie pose um, and tag three people uh, to do the same. And it's really to kind of, again, build kind of a groundswell of support for caregivers and domestic workers and care as essential work in this moment. Um, and it's also tied to the policy work we're doing to actually um, to actually expand, um, one, to expand the notion of essential workers to include domestic workers so that they can get uh, protections and benefits that they need. Um, and also to expand family care benefits for essential workers. So workers who, people who have to go to work right now also have families at home that need care um, and they're struggling to do that and sort of keep them safe in this moment. And so we're also fighting for policy um, changes and expansions of benefits and stimulus packages to include um, family care benefits for essential workers. And so the Rosie Challenge is really a way to kind of show the support for that. So yesterday we had members of members of Congress, influencers, mommy influencers, um, sort of take pictures, and we're going to continue the campaign through next week. Christina is back. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yes, Christina, would love to hear your thoughts. Yes, I wish I could have blamed that on like my daughter. <laughs> crashing the computer, but I can't. It wasn't the dog that ate my homework. Um, yeah, so the the rosy campaign, I just, we really felt like a lot of women could relate to this right now. Um, and that's, so not only would people stand in solidarity with domestic workers and family caregivers that do this work all day, every day, um, but also that in this moment they acutely feel that care is essential and that care work is hard. 
it is very rewarding, but it's very hard and it is important and it should be valued and that um, they are on the front lines of doing this work and holding their families together and holding their communities together, which is holding the fabric of our country together right now. Um, so we really felt like a lot of people would relate to this um, and that, that it would draw them in in a um, really impactful way. Yeah. Um, Ishita mentioned uh, the work that you do before policymakers and how you take a groundswell of um, activists who are caregivers and share their stories um, to push forward the necessary policy change. Could you speak a little bit more about the process of that? How does that factor into the work of each of your organizations? Well, um, NDWA uh, is an organizing organization. There is, that is our, the base, the root of who we are. Um, we are a movement centered on and always centering domestic workers themselves. Um, there is nothing that we do that domestic workers haven't shaped, haven't informed, haven't um, told us that this is um, what is the priority. Um, there is a direct accountability to everything that we do. And um, we are always taking um, their stories and centering them as central protagonists and also making sure that um, it is not me telling their story, but we pass the mic and so that domestic workers themselves can speak for themselves and tell their own stories and um, decide what they wanna share and not share and how they wanna share it. And that is like core to our um, theory of change, to our theory of showing up. Um, so all of their stories are infused and the fingerprints are in everything that we do. Um, worker feedback um, is constant. Um, we always, in ev every campaign, um, worker voices, workers commenting on the process, on the creative is always a part. Um, you have to have workers in the center. And they're part of your, I mean, accountability mechanism in a big way. I understand that the board of directors comprises people who are domestic workers. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is not, um, not the common setup. Um, and also domestic workers are um, all across our staff. Um, our affiliates, we have over 64 affiliates across the country, four different chapters. Their leadership um, is throughout everything we do. Um, this year, um, we had uh, our biggest assembly yet in Las Vegas and um, over 2,000 domestic workers, um, organizers, leaders, um, just great, great, great women were gathered um, in Las Vegas showing their power. And um, uh, yeah, it, it's just incredible. It's incredible to see. Was there a story or a person in that event that really stood out for you? Yeah, so um, my baby was our culture change campaign on the film Roma um, that came out last year. And we ha had a huge culture change campaign and um, the fantastic, talented, beautiful star, Yaitza, who played the main character, Cleo, um, came to our assembly and we honored her. And um, we were able to bring uh, backstage two of our movement elders, like really uh, two leaders who have been central to the movement for a long time and um, for a private meeting with her. And I was busy running around and then I walked in the room and I saw them speaking very close to one another and holding each their hearts and I just wept. Um, because our workers really saw something in her and saw themselves in her representation of Cleo on screen. And um, it, was, it was quite beautiful watching that connection happen um, and knowing what the film had meant to so many in our workforce 
to be centered, to be seen, uh, to feel powerful in that the Oscars were honoring them, the representation of them. Um, and so for me, observing that private moment um, mm -hmm. that wasn't on camera, wasn't in the press, I was not collecting the content to put it into anything, um, that w was for me a, a beautiful moment. Oh, yeah. It uh, would have brought tears to my eyes too. I'm so glad that that was possible and that there was that connection forged. It's really, uh, it was really tremendous that that film, you know, really was part of this tidal wave of understanding and visibility. And um, I can only imagine how much it meant to so many people and, and bringing them together in real time uh, at that kind of summit. Uh, so important. Um, the Care for All campaign, which you are leading, both of you and your organizations during the crisis of COVID-19, uh, what's next and how can audiences support you? Um, so one thing we're really thinking about right now is um, how we can move from sort of what has been, what we're now seeing is like phase one of the COVID crisis and our, our emergency kind of response to it, which the first phase was really supporting domestic workers and, and family caregivers. Um, and then what it looks like for our people and for our narrative of care as we move into this kind of recovery phase of this crisis and what that looks like. And so we've, one thing that we're thinking about um, is, you know, the content has been really pushing and supporting both our immediate recovery, immediate sort of emergency response um, in terms of what people need. Um, and it's also been sort of setting us up um, to make a really strong case for a care infrastructure. Um, and we're saying that, look, if we want to move into this recovery phase um, in a way that actually supports all of us, especially the most sort of disenfranchised, we need a robust care economy where these jobs are good jobs, where caregiver jobs are good jobs, um, and they have the benefits they need. And we need a strong care infrastructure so that anybody that needs to access care, whether it's for themselves, their child, their partner, an older parent, a person with a disability, like that is accessible and affordable. And, and so that is anyway, has always been our kind of longer term vision, but we are really kind of transitioning and as we move into this new phase um, of the crisis. And so the, the, the cultural work is going to sort of match that um, and really talk about um, you know, the interconnectedness of care. What does this care ecosystem really look like? Um, and then really push for this idea of care as a collective responsibility that needs a collective solution. Yeah. What's your vision in, in a world where caregiving is valued um, and supported with the infrastructure that it needs um, and the public acknowledgement? Uh, what does that look like, Christina, for you? Oh, wow. Um, I, I would say our, our grand vision is universal family care, which Ashita will go deeper into because it is um, carrying across generations baby. But for there to be real investment into the care infrastructure um, so that, like Ashita said, these jobs are good jobs um, and that families have the choice to be able to um, choose what kind of care they provide for their children, for their aging parents, um, and uh, be able to thrive in that so we can all, you know, um, spend our days contributing in, in, to the country through the workforce in other ways and not worry about our families. Um, for workers, I'm, this work um, needs to be paid a livable wage this workforce um, needs to have, and, and this is just the base floor, needs to have the protections and benefits that most workers um, take for granted. Um, most people don't really think that having a sick day is special. 
a lot of people just assume that most workers have a sick day. They, um, many workers do not, including domestic workers. Um, there is no paid leave. Um, the liv having a livable wage is not possible. Um, uh, contracts, having like prior agreements, um, there are a lot of essential things that we think need to be met right now. Um, and um, we need to make sure that that these jobs are well funded, and that requires um, care having um, universal family care. When we say robust care economy, we are looking not just at the current situation, but also looking forward and knowing that this is not work that's going to. These are not jobs that are going to be redundant anytime mm -hmm. soon. This work is going to stay kind of at the core of our um, of our lives in all kinds of ways, including our sort of the core of the economy. And so if we don't make these jobs good jobs, sort of the pragmatic view is is that people are not people don't, are not going to be able to do these jobs. And the domestic workers we um, we talk to, they love they're proud of their work. They love doing this work, but they don't get paid well they don't have you know the benefits that christina was talking about and so in order to sustain the bigger economy it's really important actually that we strengthen this work and this workforce um and we see this as an integrated system um for mm -hmm. a long time you know people who need care and the people who provide care have been sort of almost pitted against each other as if as if there's some, the gap lies between them, whereas actually this is like so many other issues. This is like a systemic problem. This is a structural problem. Um, it's not, you know, many families are, are struggling uh, to, to, to care for their loved ones. And many domestic workers are struggling to get by on the pay they receive and to care for their own families. And so the issue here is a much larger one. And um, the vision is, you know, for this to be, for this work to be no longer invisible, um, to be valued, to be held at the core of our communities and our society, um, and that to then be matched by sort of systems and structures and infrastructure. And so universal family care is, um, is our kind of North Star um, policy vision. It's a social insurance program that would allow everybody to pay into it um, throughout their life and everybody to actually then access that when they need it. Mm. It, also, um, it also builds in that the care jobs are paid well and are good jobs. So that is part of the program. We see this as the like an idea that needs an integrated solution. Yeah. You use the word struggle, which makes me think of what Christina was saying earlier about um, being an organizing. Uh, organization. But it also makes me think of this moment in our lives, this very strange, um, heartbreaking season of COVID-19 and the struggle that everyone is experiencing in different ways. Um, and I'm wondering how has the struggle been, how are people meeting the struggle in terms of coping strategies for the communities that you serve? I mean, yeah. I'd say, you know, people are doing, I'd say that at least, so there's a, a few different communities that we look at at Caring Across. Family caregivers are at our core, but um, seniors and people with disabilities, so people who, who require care are also um, part of our community. And, you know, they, of course, have been hit in a very particular way. They're highly at risk. Um, with this virus, and there are also people often who need care around the clock and are unable to get that right now mm. for many reasons. Um, and so, you know, there's, I'd say the thing that is, has shown up the most for all of our communities together is this idea of, of a community and community mm -hmm. support and community care. And whether that's bringing groceries to people's doors or that's bringing, mm -hmm joy and breaking the isolation for a lot of older people who are in um who are in isolation and can't and and are sort of suffering because they don't have 
their care worker coming regularly or they don't have their family member coming and checking on them. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say like community support has been the strongest, um, the strongest source of resilience. Um, mm -hmm. And again, to say that is not enough, uh, you know, but that has been, I think, the source of kind of resilience and that could, that's been virtual, that's been practical, that's been emotional. Um, and it's shown up in many different ways for um, for at least our communities. Yeah, I would yeah. say the same thing. We at NDWA, we are a home for those that work in our home. So um, we have weekly webinars on Thursday nights for workers. Um, if you are a domestic worker or you know a domestic worker, please guide them to domesticworkers.org. There's a click there for our worker hub and you can find tons of resources and also join the weekly webinars where we um, actually address directly what workers are looking for right now in terms of information, in terms of um, being able to discuss in a safe space questions they have, mm -hmm. um, um, different various issues they're trying to navigate that maybe NDWA you know, has, has not necessarily in the past talked about um, where is your local food pantry? Mm -hmm. Our organizers have created a hub where you can look up where your local food pantry is. Um, mm -hmm. We're aggregating information about um, evictions and about, you know, how to navigate this. So we are really trying to serve the needs of our community and providing a space for workers to come together and share information and also just share and know that they are in a safe space and they are home and they have um, they have somewhere to be in community. And being in community is so, so powerful. Um, speaking of community, I'm wondering if we have any questions from the audience. Um, that last one was was a question. I think um, we, we have a question about um, a living wage, a decent living wage, and the fact that as we transition in this um, world where we're increasingly relying on technology, um, how we make sure that the future of work, even if we incorporate more technology, is also a future that prioritizes care and that prioritizes the human aspects of everything. Yeah, um, so I'll say, I feel like there was two questions in, in that right now. I'm, I'm thinking that there might be some employers tuning in. Um, and so we also are trying to speak to employers who want to do the right thing, um, but they might also be struggling with providing. So we did create a resource called um, at employers.domesticworkers.org where we offer guidance to employers. Um, our director, Ijen, loves to talk about how robots, uh, they've tried to have a robot fold a towel for like 20 years or something and it's never worked. So in particular, the AI question, um, these jobs are not going to be done by robots. That's never gonna happen. Um, my daughter's not gonna learn how to crawl following a you know, vacuum robo thing. That's never gonna work. Um, so we, and we also, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, we have a federal domestic worker bill of rights um, that's been introduced in Congress. Um, and it's sponsored by Senator um, Harris and uh, Congresswoman Jayapal. Um, and um, that would really provide a, um, a structure for domestic work to have livable wages, benefits, um, innovations, um, so that um, changes in the economy are very responsive. Workers can respond to that in real time by setting up um, uh, local boards. The city of Philadelphia recently passed uh, um, a domestic worker bill of rights and embedded in it uh, is a space for domestic workers to regularly be in, in conversation with lawmakers and employers. So that's like an innovation. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we can ensure that um, these jobs continue to be able to provide for your family, mm -hmm. but not through uh, protections. Yeah. yeah. Can I also add to the sort of the robot question? I feel like, you know, when we talk about 
um, care and caregiving and what care workers do in homes, people seem to think that it's either completely like medicalized, like what they do is just do like sort of, you know, administering like medication sure. um, kind of work or it's like maybe like supporting in sort of the activities of daily living, which are like getting dressed and getting showered. And I'm talking specifically about care for people with disabilities or, or elders, but there's a lot of caregiving that is about companionship, um, mm. that is about emotional support. Um, those are things that are, when we talk to what we call our care pairs, um, you know, care workers and those they're caring for, there's a lot that happens there that is not just sort of these like very important sort of mechanical tasks. Um, there's, and, and not that those mechanical tasks I can see happening via robot anytime soon, but especially the sort of the other things that we need in our lives, the companionship, the, the, the care, the like relationship, the, um, you know, the emotional support, those things cannot be replaced by um, automated um, beings. And that's a huge part of, there's a reason we call it care, you know, um, that is a huge part of what um, domestic workers provide families in homes. And it's also a huge part of what other family members who are caring for people provide. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about um, what it means to be a family caregiver and a term that caring across generations uses is the sandwich generation, which, you know, people who are caring for young people and elders and, and others who need care. And I think it's critical in this time that we remember that the, the directions of care are multiple um, and that in all those directions, there is emotion and there is compassion. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is not something that, as you said, a robot can provide. Um, we are just about to close, but we wanted to end with one uh, final audience question, which is, what gives you hope? Mm, I mean, I think for me, the fact of, the fact of how, the, the way that people are connecting through this time um, the, the multitude of ingenious and creative ways that we are all coming up with to connect, to care for each other, to, um, yeah, to reach out. Um, you know, there's all kinds of interesting like thought pieces about how isolation might lead to this and that. But I, I, I really believe that we do care for each other and we do care for our collective. And some Sometimes that gets lost in sort of the hyper, in this like hyper capitalist like individual narrative that we live in. Um, but the fact that we do care and our intrinsic deep human need is to to connect and to care um, is what gives me hope. Um, and I am kind of I'm an extrovert, so I feel this even more strongly. But I think there's many people. Um, who might not identify as extroverts who are who are reaching out in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. Um, yeah. I, I would say the resiliency of women. Mm -hmm. I think that the last three years have shown me over and over again, the power, the leadership, uh, the fortitude of women um, in particular, the leadership of women of color, and um, that no matter how many times um, knocked down, you come back up. I think women, um, you know, mothers are you can hold a lot, and um, or you know, beyond mothers, anyone who cares for someone as a sheet of, you know, the saying, um, we can handle a lot. And so in that, I, uh, that gives me hope that we will move forward. We will continue to progress. We will find a way where there is no way. Um, yeah. Couldn't have ended on a more, um, important, uh, 
note. And we want to thank everyone for tuning in today. We hope that you'll join us for future Breakthrough Spotlight events and that you will follow Caring Across Generations and the National Domestic Workers Alliance on social media, on their websites. Please join them in their efforts in response to COVID-19 and moving forward. Um, we are continuing our series on care. We are going to be speaking next week about alternative models to care and the ways that activists are organizing and leaning on to each other. Um, state and outside of the often criminalizing public response. Um, so we're very excited for the imagination um, and the community that is going to be bubbling up in that conversation. Thanks again for tuning in and um, everyone take care. Thank you. Thank you. And Ishita and Christina, thanks so much. <laughs>